Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm so happy to be standing in front of you. Like I said, it's my first time. So I thank God for the opportunity and for the privilege. Also, I thank God for Pastor Manuel and his wife, beautiful wife, let me say. They have been a good friend to me since uh, I've given my life to Christ about four years ago. And he's my father in the Lord. He's my mentor since that time until now. And tonight, whatever expectation that you come with, God is going to touch you. And he's going to speak to you. As I'm preaching the word, he's going to be touching you still because that's what the word says. He sent forth his word and his word healed them and delivered them from all their distractions. So God will be healing you while you're listening to the word tonight. Amen. It's biblical. Amen. You may please have your seat. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us turn to the book of John, chapter 15. Before taking much time of you, I want to get into the word of God. John chapter 6, actually, not 15. Amen. Amen. Are we there? It's one of my favorite scriptures. Since uh, if you read this scripture before, you will know it talks about Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. And I'm from Sudan. I'm from South Sudan. If you've been following the news lately, you will see people are starving there. And this is the kind of miracle they need to have in South Sudan right now. You know, you have to feed people. That's the greatest miracle Jesus ever did. Amen. So it says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five burly loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, or in the place, sorry. So the man sat down in number, about 5,000, and Jesus took the, the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to, to those who are sitting down. Likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five burly loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Verse 15, Therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 It's a very powerful scripture. Do you believe it? Yes. As we know, the theme for this day is, uh, is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 19. And it says, the, for the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestations of the sons of God, or of the children of God. Amen. How many children of God in the house today? 
Amen. Bless the Lord. I'm happy to see all the hands going up because indeed God is our Father and we are His children. You know, after these things, the Bible says Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is by the land or by the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed Him. And I asked myself, how come they are following Jesus even all the way to the mountain? He was wondering, and he saw them coming to him. He left the city, but they're still following him. At that time, he was not yet known as the Messiah because they knew he was born by Virgin Mary, but still they did not believe that he is the Son of God or the Anointed One. But he saw them coming. Not because of anything, but because of the signs they saw him performing on those who are sick, those who are diseased, those who are afflicted. And a great multitude came to him. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and they came after him. One great thing I want you to know is that these people, they have homes. They have children. They have wives and husbands. But... They said, we're going to go to the mountains. There is no water there. Now we have water fountains in buildings. So in the street, sometimes you can see in the park, you can drink a water and walk. It was not so then. Hallelujah. Amen. One important thing I want to you know, also let you know is that Jesus asked Philip, what can we do to feed these people? Because he knew their need. They need the bread or they need food. Those people are hungry spiritually. They are hungry physically. You know, they walk for miles. And they, their strength is out. They need someone to help them. And he asked Philip to see if Philip has faith or has faith to believe that he can provide for these people as a son of God. To his surprise, Philip was talking about money. It's like 200 worth of denarii. You know, looking back to the days then, 200 worth, the saying is about six months salary or wages or about a yearly wage. He is telling that to them, to Jesus, that this is how much we're going to spend on these people alone because there were only 5,000 men. No women, no children were counted in this. This is their tradition. I don't know why they're doing this then, but they will count the men. And theologian says, when you count the women and the children, there are about 25,000 in total, all coming to Jesus. 25,000 people coming to Jesus. And he has to fix their situation for them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But Philip was talking about money because he did not have faith to believe that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, have the power to make these people satisfied. Amen. Amen. And also the feeding of the 5,000 people showed us the generosity of God, of how much he cared about us as human beings, how much he cared for you, how much he cared for me. He took that little from that little boy and multiplies it to more to feed the whole people. So God takes the little that you have and he makes it useful. And whatever things that you come with today, no matter how tangible, no matter how small it is, God is going to turn it big. And when you leave this place, you're going to be a blessing. Not just to your family, not just to your friend, but to the whole world. Because the world is suffering. As we saw in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 19. The world is going through so much. And only a child of God can do something about it. Do you believe that? Yeah. Only a child of God can do something about it. Yeah. If you believe it, shout amen. 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 I believe I can do something about it. Because I'm a child of God. The whole world is suffering. If you look at the trees, even in the summertime, it's supposed to be green. Some trees are dying. If you look at the people, we're supposed to be walking and healthy and helping each other. But some people are in jail. Some people are in hospitals. Amen. If you look around you, there are so much things to be fixed. And Adam and Eve didn't fix it. Only you can fix it today, and it's not too late. Do you believe it? Yes. Adam and Eve didn't fix it, but you can fix it today. Hallelujah. Amen. God is a good God. Yes. He's a good God. 
when you trust him and when you believe in him, when you come to seek his face, you will not be the same. He will turn your life around, not just for your own good, but for the good of those around you. And when they see you and they see God in you, without you preaching to them about Jesus, they will want to come to church. They will want to give their life to Christ. And I'm telling you from experience, I've hung around people that give their life to Christ, not because I preach to them, but because they have seen the kind of lifestyle I live. Because they have seen the kind of things I do, and they come to Jesus. They want, I want to come to your church. Where is the church, man? I want to come there. Ask them to come. I was a kid, seven years old, and I will take them to church. And they will come to church. And now, even though I'm in Canada, they're still serving God in Sudan. And they were not younger than me. They were not older than me, but they're all ages. And they're still serving God faithfully. And that's the kind of thing I believe God can do in your life today also, after tonight. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Before I go any further, I just wanted to, to say something humbly. I just wrote a book. And this is why I know this is a setup from God. Because God has called me into ministry as an evangelist. And I was home thinking, praying, asking God for direction. How do I get to a ministry when everything costs money? You know? And yes, I got a job. But when God told me to write a book, I was beside myself. How can I write a book? It's for smart people. I want to write a book in the future when I'm maybe 40 or something, 50. And, and God told me, write a book. Tell them about your testimony. Something that I've done in your life. Where I've brought you from and how I've transformed your life. And now you are serving me. Tell the people. And this book will be a testimonial book about your lifestyle that will bless everybody. And I sat down in my room that night. It was at 12 a.m. I didn't sleep. I started writing. I started writing. I started writing. Everything that would come to my mind from my childhood. And in five days, I finished the book. In five days, I finished the book. And... And it was, it's, just, it's not a, it's about 15, 16,000 words. So you may think maybe this is impossible or possible, but I'm 26 years old. I'm still in school, but this is what God can do. And because he said it, I wrote it. I wrote it as he led me through it, as he guided me and he gave me words and inspiration on what to put down and what not to put down. And I prayed as like, God, any words that you don't want me to write, I don't want to write but the ones that you want to bless the people with, let me write. And he gave me the word. And the book just published this week. And I brought some to you so you can have a copy of it and read it to bless your life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I titled the book, As the Holy Spirit Let Me, World's Empty Promise. Because I'm a kind of guy, oh, I was a guy who was in the world before, although we're still in the world. But there's another world that we're in, the world of darkness. And that's what God told me to write this title on that book. That this world that we're in will not benefit or satisfy us from anything. But only when we are trusting in him alone. Amen? Amen. So at the end of the service, or at the end of the night, try to get a copy. And read about what God can do in someone's life. And your faith will not be the same again. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to share with you that scripture one more time, just the background of it. Why Jesus had to feed these 5,000 people. I went to Bible school, but this is not Bible school knowledge. This is, this is Holy Spirit. He said, in, this day, oh, in those days, the Jewish community was suffering. You will have a property, you will have a farm. You will go and, and sow your seed or your fruits will come out and Caesar will seize it from you. Or he'll make you pay a lot of taxes on these things and you can't afford it. What happened to your farm? He takes over. You're about to go and rip it. He will take it. He will say you did not pay this tax. You did not pay that tax. He will take it from you. People have to go back to him to beg to eat to survive. Yes, there were some rich people like Zacchaeus in the Bible. 
you know, people who compromised to work with the Gentiles and to live with them and to just, you know, go about life like the Pharisees. They want to make sure you don't serve God. They want to make sure you join them and, 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 and compromise under the law of God so you can live. But those people said no. These people, they are Roman Empire. They came from Rome and they're taking over our properties. And they want someone that can go and speak for their right. They want someone that can go and stand before Caesar and tell them, this is their property, this is their land, this is where they are born. You can't seize everything that they have. How are they going to survive? They have children. But nobody was able to go and face Caesar for them. Amen. The Pharisees, they will tell you, you're not even qualified to come close to us. You're not holy. Because they wear a white robe. They have long beard, big hair. And the the living life of holy people. But their holiness was not really holiness. And they will tell you, don't come close to me. You're defiled or you're a sinner. But they will live happy. They will eat happy. And they were so healthy. But you are not. You are skinny. And your children cannot go to school. You can't afford anything. Because everything you have, Caesar takes it from you. They turn to Jesus who the Pharisees hate. And also, the Roman Empire didn't like so much because he was gathering a great multitude to to himself because of his words. He was a powerful leader. Amen? Amen? That was why they turned to Jesus to come and to have him help them, to have him give them something to eat. Hallelujah. That was a bad news, isn't it? That was a bad news. You work hard for what you have, and someone takes it from you. Not just an ordinary man, but a ruler, someone above you, will take it away from you. You can't go fight him physically. You can't go fight him with weapons. You cannot go fight him with anything because you can't get close to him. He has so much armies around himself. And the armies, too, are benefiting from what they have seized because now belong to them, too. And I said to myself, when I read the scripture, I was like, so there is no good news anywhere. There is no good news in this world. In the time of Jesus, even in our own time today, there is no good news. And I said, I can go to CBC. You can go to CNN. You can go to BBC. You can come back to CTV again to just double check if there's anything good. There is nothing at all. You will find there is no good news. And I said, if the world can only give one minute of that news hour to Jesus, their lives of this world will not be the same again. There will be peace and rest everywhere. But they don't want that. They want to watch the fight in Iraq, the fight in Sudan, the fight all over. That's what they want to watch. And at night, you can't sleep. Your mind is disturbed. You are worrying about your children's future or about your own future. You're worrying about how next year is going to look like for my business. Because there's so much trouble. It's It's no guarantee. When is Jesus coming to save us and take us to heaven? He's not coming yet. He's not coming yet. He's coming soon, but not yet. The apostle Paul said he's coming soon 2,000 years ago. We're still here waiting, but he's coming soon. And when God says soon, soon could be another 1,000 years. It could be another 100 years or another five, or even now. It's not guaranteed. So the Bible says a day with God is like a thousand, and a thousand is like a day. So we never know when Jesus is coming back to take us. But today, as a child of God in this house, the world is looking up to you. The world is looking up to you. Amen? Amen. So the bad news surrounded people, they have to turn back to Jesus for a good news. And that's what I said. Only Jesus is a good news. When he came down to the world, the word good news came alive. Because people running from community to communities, from street to streets, saying, have you heard it? What did you, what did you hear? The Messiah is here. And Nathaniel said, I have to see him. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Why Nazareth? Because Nazareth was not a good place. It was very poor. It's, very dark. it's in Israel itself, but it's, it was not so rich. 
And when they say, Jesus is going to come from there, it's like, no. I can't believe it. If you tell me from Jerusalem, you know, if you tell me from those big cities, I'll, I'll at least believe it. But Nazareth, no. And they told him, come and see. And this is what you had to do tonight. You have come to see what God is going to do in the life of those who trust him. What God is going to do in your life tonight. You are here to see. Hallelujah. They came to Jesus because they wanted to hear good news. They want to forget about their struggles. They want to forget about what they are going through. They want to forget about the situation with the government. And come to hear something about God. And even something that will benefit them physically, to eat. Amen? Amen. Amen. So people were in deep trouble and they needed a savior. And that was Jesus. Today, the same thing. The world is in deep trouble. They wanted a savior. But we're looking around for God. Oh God, come and save these people. Come and save my house. Come and save my children. God, come and save my friend. We pray. We even fast and, and we, we seek God's face. It's not that it's not going to answer us. But God is looking to you to save them. And you're looking to God to come and save them. What's going to happen? Nothing. When somebody's waiting for something to happen, and something is waiting for somebody to do something, then nothing happens. Because we're all expecting you to come, and I'm, you're waiting for me to come. But we're not going to come. Somebody got to take a move. Somebody got to take the action, got to make a move. And that's why you're here today to hear about Jesus. Amen. And how much, as a child of God, as a Christian, you are Christ-like. The same thing Jesus did, you can do also. The same thing he did, you can do also. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The multitude came to him because... There was no other solution. He was the only one they can come to. And he was an ordinary person. The, the theologian says he was five, seven, five, six. Short man. I'm five, I'm five, eight at least. He was shorter than me. But those people, are, and he was a small man too. Very small. If he's proved by a scientist, then we can't doubt it most time. Although the Holy Spirit can reveal to us in heaven that Jesus is a handsome, tall, you know, with the, with the long hair and all that. That's different. Amen. Amen. But that was what the scientists said, that he was a short man. And they were all coming to him to help them. An honorary man like you and I is not muscular. He's not buff. He did not have anything that you can say, I want this man to, to help me. But they knew something about him, that they followed him. Amen. Amen. And even if you look at his friends, you will know this man cannot do much to you. His friends are fishermen. You know? His friends are people who are not educated, they are uneducated people. They go fishing. Sometimes they catch fish, sometimes they don't. And it's proof in the Bible. The other time Jesus would come and tell them, throw your net on that side. And they did, and the miracle happened. Because sometimes they go hungry. You see, those people, I said to myself, they were not poor because of anything. But I begin to understand that they were poor because people don't like to eat much fish in those days, probably. I'm thinking to myself, people like to eat beef, they like to eat goat meats and, and you know, lamb. Even in, the, in Israel, fish, no, not so much, and it was cheap. So they were not able to make much money. And I was like, oh, now I know. Now I know. It's just today that fish become very expensive. It's just now fish become expensive because people, people don't eat it as much. So it become, the price went up. Amen. Amen. And that's what I was like, no. Peter, Peter was not just poor because of anything, but people don't like it. The fish was not so much uh, sold in those days. Hallelujah. Amen. But these were the people he was hanging out with. Not people who know so much about the word of God. They were not in school in any way. They can't even come close to church because of their clothes. They smell like fish. Nobody wants to sit close to you. They will walk out. The Pharisees will tell you, you are not welcome. You are not welcome. 
you can sit out the door and hear what the preacher is preaching. And if you cannot hear him because there's no microphone, too bad. You miss it. These were the people he was hanging out with. Now, imagine you're coming up to someone like this to help you. How is he going to help you? With what is he going to help you? But they have faith. They're like, no, he will help us. This man will help us. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And when they came to him, he did not chase them away. That's why I love Jesus. He did not chase them away. In fact, he began to make them know how much he cared for them. Before they get close to him, he began to ask for solution. Because as leaders, you don't want to hang out with someone that have problems too much, without solution too much. I like to hang out with people that have solutions for problems. If you hang out with people that bring problems, you will not go far in life. People that have solutions will help you go far. He turned to Philip. Philip, what can we do? And Philip said, you know, this much money, six months wages have to be spent on these people. Are you sure you want us to do that? And they have money. Jesus is not a poor man. Because they said he has uh, Judas Iscariot as a treasurer. How can you have a treasure if you are broke? So I believe they have money. And so he was not a poor man. Although the Bible says he became poor, that we may become rich through his poverty. But he was not a poor man while he was walking. He would walk places, but he was saving money to help people. Not to save himself, but people. When Philip told him that this is how much we're going to spend on these people. Everything we saved from six months ago until now, we have to pay, we have to buy food for these people with. He turned back and said, six months. Wages is a lot of money. And they said maybe it's about $7 now. But then it was a lot of money. People don't get paid as much. You work long hours, they pay you a cent. And you live with it. It was a lot of money to them. Amen. Amen. But he said, he turned around and Simon Peter's brother said to him, Andrew said to him, Lord, there's a boy here, a little boy, a lad, that have five burly bread and two fish. That was the solution to him. That was a big solution to him. Because God... Yes, God creates something out of nothing. But on earth, right, the time that we're in right now, God can do something out of something. God takes what you have, plus what you have, becomes supernatural. The natural you have, add to the supernatural of his, becomes supernatural. He took the little the boy has, and he increased it. Many times, many, many, many times, people ate, people enjoyed themselves, and people are dancing. The Bible didn't say that, but I'm just suggesting. They begin to dance. They begin to celebrate. This is the Savior. This is the man. This is who we're supposed to be following all this time. And they begin to rejoice and dance and celebrating this great miracle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's the problem that God can solve. Things that we cannot do by ourselves. We have something about it, a little something to it. But only if we bring it to God, he will make it big. And he will solve every situation around you. Not just in your life, but around you. And one day I was in a church, I was praying, and God told me, I'm not going to give you money, Thomas, to go into ministry. I said, why? Why? He said, because if I give you money, tomorrow you will need money again. And tomorrow you will need money again. And the next day you need money again and again. I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to give you an idea. To make money and to keep money coming. And that's what God can do. God doesn't give us money, but he gives you an idea. He gives you something to make sure what, you, what he has given you continues. Continues. And you don't beg anymore. Hallelujah. 
Amen. God loves his children so much that he did not chase them away. He did not send them home. But he made sure that they were satisfied and they were accepted. When we go back to the book of Genesis, you know, we saw how Adam and Eve, when God has given them what they're supposed to have, they lost it. Not because of anything, but because of one problem. Sin. And they did not even know why they were given those things to take care of. These people that Jesus helped have the solution also. But they didn't know, the, they didn't know how to solve it. So, Jesus showed them an example. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah. Is God good? Are we learning so far? That was what God can do. He loved his children so much that when he gave Adam the Garden of Eden or the the world to rule over, he, he, he did not make him to just be a slave, to just sit there and just work day in and day out and, and just sweat so hard and just work and just work and just work and just work. You come home, you tell Eve, oh, Eve, man, God, God is, God is, I don't know, it's just a lot of work. But that was not why God made them. But today we're struggling to survive. And the problem was one, why Adam lost it. He was the son of God. God made him in his image, in his, in his own image, and in his own likeness. That means he thinks like God. He could act like God. What God said, I don't like. He doesn't like either. You know, in other words, I would say he was junior to God. He was a junior. So this is junior, you know. It's very nice. He thinks, he look at him, he ran like me. He act like me. He even talk like me. That was how God viewed Adam. But Adam didn't even understand that at the beginning. So he lost it. And the image of God was defiled or was ruined. And I said to myself, since the time Adam and Eve fell, heaven was never the same anymore. If you believe that with me, you will understand that heaven, since the time Adam and Eve fell or were deceived by the enemy and were robbed out of their glory, heaven was never the same. That was why God had to send his son Jesus to solve this problem. He was a solution to us. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ was not just a philosopher. He was not just a good teacher, as many people would say. He was a good teacher. He was a good prophet. He was a good philosopher. Even some uh, people say that. He's a philosopher. Some people said he was a good prophet. You know, he was, I mean, a good preacher, a shepherd. All these were good answers. Even the Bible testified to it. But one important thing you need to know, he is the son of God. He is the savior of the world. Died for my sin and for your sin to make us live at peace with God. That things that is happening around us in the world today will not affect you. Why? Because you are undercover. And you are protected and you are guided by his steps as he leads you day by day. Things that you hear will not get to you because it comes from this area and goes to the other side. Hallelujah. And that was why Jesus Christ came. To set you and I free. To make us come back to the Father because Adam has lost their relationship. Hallelujah. The second Adam or the last Adam was a life-giving spirit. He came to give life to us that we may understand who our father is and live according to his likeness. Live according to the way that is expected of us. Hallelujah. Four years ago, I gave my life to Christ. And before then, I was a very bad person. You'd be like, but you are young, how can you be a bad person? I was very bad. Yes, my mom uh, raised me in the way of God. And I went to church. If you buy the book, you will read the testimony, most of it there. 
I went to church. I played instrument in the church. By the time it came for myself to decide what I want, and I was a grown man at that age, she could not tell me what to do with force anymore like they can do when you're a kid. I decided to do things my own way, like the prodigal son. My own way of life, I want to live it. I was 19 years of age, and I went on with my life. I will live at home, I will come, I will live home part time. Part time, I will say part time because sometimes I'll come home, sometimes I won't come home. Sometimes I'll come and sleep, and sometimes I'll sleep outside at my friend's house, at the hotel, at the motel, you name it. And I was living life without meaning completely. I was in school. What I was learning at school was not helping me. I was selling drugs. You're like, this guy selling drugs and he's preaching. Yes. I was selling drugs. I was walking around with gun in my pocket or in my back, you name it. I would drink, I would smoke, I would fornicate. My mind was not my own anymore. It was, it was corrupted by the devil. The influence around me. But one thing I realized was that there was no satisfaction. I would sit down at the end of the night, count how much money I made. There was no peace. I would be looking around me, afraid of people. Who is coming to rob me? Who is coming to kill me? Who is my enemy? Should I keep him close or keep him far? Right? But one night, I came to a realization. I was like, no. My mom, my dad... They didn't bring me to Canada to live life like this. And this is even not why God has brought me here, because if you read news about Sudan, you will know there's so much war, so much thing going on. A lot of child soldiers were recruiting every year or every day. They will come to your neighborhood, seeing you playing with your friends. A big truck will pull over, and they will put you in it. Your mom is going to come after you running too late. They took you. And I was like, my mom saw something I did not see in myself. She brought me here for a specific reason and purpose. Let me live my life the right way. And I begin to pray, asking God, I want to stop living this way. I want to stop living this way. Help me. I have lots of friends that are looking up to me, and those that I'm looking up to, all in the streets. They will be calling me, telling me to come back. A time came where I got shot. And God was merciful. I didn't die because I was praying that he should save me, that I may, I may change. And again, he gave me another chance. I didn't change. I got to so many accidents. I would be like, God, only if you help me this time, I would, I would change. Many times I got put out by a police. I never changed. But one day, I came to my senses. And at that point, I began to say to myself, no more selling drugs. No more hanging out with bad friends. No more doing things that I want to do. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And I started to look for a job. I threw away my drugs in the toilet. I flashed it. Broke my cell phone for selling drugs. Lived without a cell phone for some time to just get away from people. They would come to my house asking, but I would ignore them most times. I got a job, I began to work, you know, legit. And there I began to understand who I am in Christ and why he has brought me this far. And I began to pray a prayer of repentance and he changed my life. Four years ago, I was transformed and here I am standing in front of you today because he has called me into ministry to change and to transform life. And as an evangelist, it is my calling that God will use me for his purpose to increase heaven and to decrease hell. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When I begin to saw things from the eyes of God, I begin to understand I was created for a specific purpose. But before then, I didn't know my purpose. And I begin to understand that if you see something from a 3D perspective and just an HD or just a regular TV, 
it was not a big difference. And that's how it was for me when I saw things from God's perspective. It became so clear and so bright. And I was like, no, I'm a man of purpose. I have a reason to live. Hallelujah. Tell someone next to you, God has made you for a purpose. And you have a reason to live. You are not just another person walking this earth, waiting to die, and go and be forgotten. When you die, God is going to make people know this person has left because he has used you for great things in this world. Hallelujah. As a child of God, you are born to manifest the glory of God. You can't live life like anybody else. You are different. You are unique. You are an extraordinary person. And God's purpose in your life must come alive that you may understand who he is. I was sitting at home. In two months, I wrote four books. One is published and three is waiting. And I said to myself, that was not me. That was not me. The strength I had and the, the, the knowledge I have was not enough to do this. But that was what God can do. I'm now doing my devotion book. I'm working on my devotion book, sir, for 2017. Amen. And I'm still doing more work in it. And that will be my fifth book. That's what God can do through your life. You will still be in school. You will still be working. You will still live with your parents at my age of 26. But God has a great purpose in your life. The time you're living this world, people know you have passed by. Amen. You can't be driving in the street and see a Ferrari and you say you didn't see it. It's impossible. You can't see a Lamborghini passing by and say, oh, that was a Corvette or something. It's impossible. You will know this is an important and expensive car. And that's who you are in the hands of God. You are very important. When you pass by, people know you. When they hang around you, they know this person was just here. And I'm blessed because of their lifestyle. I am blessed because of their behavior. I am changed because of what I see in these people. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But this thing will not be done in your life unless you know Jesus Christ. And only if you know him, he will begin to reveal to you these things and who you are and how you ought to live day by day. Amen. Amen. And that's why I was sharing my testimony to let you know that only God was able to show me my purpose of being in this world. Tonight, if you're here, before we pray for those people who are sick, people who are in need of healing. If you're here and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you have given your life to Jesus Christ, but at some time you backslid because things got hard. Situation arises and, and I mean, circumstance and, and things that you cannot understand came. And you backstep from your faith. You find it hard to read your Bible. You find it hard to pray. You once had fire for God, but the fire is not there anymore. And you want that fire and that zeal that you once had for God to come alive. I am very happy to be standing here to invite you that you should come forward and give your life to him once again or dedicate your life to him again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are that person and you are here right now and you know God is telling you, go, it's because he loves you. The biggest sin is to reject the only Savior, the Son of God. That is the biggest sin, to reject him.